Well, Vernon kind of tipped my hand a little bit. I'm glad he did. We're going to talk about giving financially this morning. And uh, I, don't, I hope to, not to make it real heavy, but we are going to look at three texts this morning. And it goes right along with what we've been talking about, what is true worship. And it fits right into our annual theme of the house of prayer. You see, in order for us to have a house of prayer, in order for this church to be a house of prayer, and by the way, we'll be, for the next few weeks we'll be speaking specifically about prayer. We haven't gone away from it. But in order for us to really have a house of prayer, for these ribbons up here to mean anything at all, we've got to have clean hands and clean hearts. Now, if there was a sin in our church, you know, you pick a sin. And I knew about it and you knew about it. And it was prevalent in our church. You'd want me to address that, wouldn't you? As the, as the pastoral leader of this church, you'd expect me to address that sin, wouldn't you? You'd want me to. You, may, you might not be participating in it. That might be something. But you know your neighbor is. And you know they're struggling with that issue. And you don't want to see them struggle with that issue. You'd want your pastor to address that. And that's what I see in our church. Does, does the church, does God need our money? No, he doesn't need our money. The Bible says he owns all the wealth in all the world. If he wanted your money, he'd just take it. That isn't the issue. Could the church exist without your giving? Yes, it could. Could God just move on some multimillionaire's heart to send the crossroads $25 million this week. Could he do that? He could. He could do that. But that still would not relieve us of the responsibility and the opportunity of worshiping God with our money. Whether that happened or didn't happen, it, wouldn't, it would still not relieve us of the opportunity and the responsibility of worshiping God with our money. Now, a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, I preached a series of sermons in which I talked about the guardrails and prison bars. Y'all remember that? The, the directions of God on how to run a planet is contained within the Bible. Whether or not you will live within God's will or outside of His will depends on your perspective. Do you see His rules? Do you see His requests, His demands, His commands? Do you see them as prison bars that... Limit your freedom, or do you see them as guardrails that protect you while you appreciate everything that he has given you? And you all got that. I, heard, I even heard some people in, the, in conversations around the community using that phrase, well, guardrails versus prison bars. Really? Yeah. Bang, bang. Well, when it comes to giving, we have a perspective problem. We either look at giving as a tax or an investment. When we talk about giving to the church, we look at it either as a tax or an investment. Now, I have some investments. And we, get, we invest regularly, monthly, in those savings investments, those vehicles. And uh, when I sit down at the first of the month, and we begin to write out our investment checks, and actually now we do it electronically, we don't sit there and grumble and complain, man, I've got to... Man, I'm going to add another stinking $300 to my mutual fund. Dad, gum it. Why, why do they never leave me alone? Don't they get it that I have things I want to do? And here I've got to shove $300 in that mutual fund? Of course I don't do that. I can't write that check fast enough. I get my quarterly statements and my annual statements, and I watch how that money is growing, and I'm excited about it. And I say, man, this is a good deal. I learned a long time ago to give to God the same way. When God changed my perspective, when I stopped looking at giving to God as a tax and started looking at it as an investment, it changed my whole outlook on giving. And I would dare say most Christians, particularly within this church, do not look at giving as an investment, they look at it as a tax. You say, well, Jim, that's a pretty severe judgment. How are you able to make that judgment? I see the giving. I see the giving records. The majority of people in this church don't even tip the church. 
When you go to a restaurant, you give your server more money than you give the God who put breath in your lungs and the money in your wallet so you could go to the restaurant. And I want to teach you this morning that God is going to measure us according to the way we use the wealth that he has given us. Not because he needs our money. Because we've already established he owns all the wealth in all the world. But because he wants us to see that he's given us the chance to both love him and be loved by him and to invest eternally. And so I'm going to look at three passages talking about worship again. What does God treasure most regarding worship? What does, he, what does he treasure most regarding worship? Our hearts. He treasures our hearts. He wants a pure heart. Okay? So first, let's look at Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at 19 through 24. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Many people preach, I've preached many sermons on this. We're just going to go through it real quickly. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, it's interesting that in that sentence, he nails it right there. He says, do not store up for yourselves. Didn't Jesus say, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must first deny himself? So when we store up stuff for ourselves, this verse has something to say for us and to us. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now catch this. Here's the keynote verse. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, when we look at worship and we look at worshiping God with our whole heart, the first thing we should start with is where's my treasure? What are the things that I value most in my life? And wherever those things are that you value most in your life, that's where your heart is. So if you want your heart to be close to God, now catch this, it's real simple. If you want your heart to be close to God, move your treasure. If your treasure is your children or your grandchildren, the way to move your heart closer to God is move your children and grandchildren closer to God. If your treasure is your house and your speedboat and your ATV and your snowmobile and your baseball and your football and your fantasy leagues, move them closer to God and your heart will move closer to God. If your treasure is in your money which buys all those things we've just talked about. Just move it closer to God and your heart will automatically be closer to God. That's a simple truth that Jesus is telling us right here. How do we get there? Well, it starts with what we see. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. If the eyes are healthy, the whole body will be full of light. Now, here's how I interpret that. If I look at all the opportunities in the world to spend money, and I look at it from the standpoint of this thing could really move the kingdom of God forward, then my eyes are seeing good stuff. My light is good light. But if I'm looking at all the things in the world that I can use my money for, and it's all about me and making me better and making my life better, then I think my light, my eyes are unhealthy. The things I'm letting into my body are not good for me. It says your whole body will be full of darkness. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And then he brings it right back home. You can say, well, Jimmy, I'm not sure you're talking about money there, is he? Well, he started with the idea of where your treasure is, there where your heart be also. How, this is how he concludes it. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Get this, you cannot serve both God and money. Clearly, Jesus is talking about the light in our soul that comes through our eyes having to do with money. Let me tell you how this affects you. The average American has more than 30000 Did you hear that? Over $30,000 of personal debt. That's not the mortgage on the house. That's personal debt. Every man, woman, and child in America... 300 million of us have an average of $30,000 of personal debt. That means a bunch of us that don't have any are balancing scales for a bunch that have a lot. 
I was talking to a family this last week about this issue, and I said, you know, I, I left the Air Force in 1990, started my own financial services company. I was in financial services for seven years, then I went into the ministry. I've been in ministry about 20 years now, coming up on 20 next year, it'll be 20 years. And in the 26 years that I've been counseling people on money, I have never once in 26 years counseled the family on money who was tithing. Not one time in 26 years has a family who was tithing had to come to me and say, Pastor, we're in trouble financially. Can you give us some advice? Can you help us? Now, I don't know about you, but that to me is like a pretty good investment. If I'm giving God my first fruits and he's protecting me from the financial worries and stresses that everybody else around me is facing, that is an investment. That's not a tax. And Jesus says right here, you can't serve both God and money. So what does God desire most regarding the worship of our, with money? He desires our heart. He desires our heart. Now, what is your perspective about giving money to the church? What's your perspective? As I said, a lot of people look at it as a tax. I've got to give money to the church. But as Vernon said, it really isn't about giving to the church. It's about giving to God. He just happens to use the church on earth because he's not here right now. He's here in spirit, but he's not here physically. And so he uses the church to do his work in the world. Do you know that you can thwart the will of God? Now, we're not going to get into a deep theological discussion about whether God has everything all mapped out but the Bible gives us many examples of how people thwart the work of God. The, one of the best examples that most of us are familiar with is Jonah. God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach because I'm going to kill all those people in 30 days. And so what did Jonah do? Instead of going to Nineveh, he went the other way. And he wound up being fish bait for three days. And after spending three days in the belly of a fish... He finally got his act together and got his head together, decided that maybe giving to God was an investment and not a tax. And he was willing to make that investment. God redeemed him, threw him up on the shore, and he went to Nineveh. But the amazing thing is God didn't judge Nineveh. God didn't destroy them. Instead, they repented and they all got saved. We can thwart God's plan for this church. Many of you have come to me and said, when are we going to buy land? When are we going to build a new building? When are we going to get that Christian school that you saw in 1999, Jim? Well, you know what? I got news for you. It takes money to do that. Somebody complained about the condition of our rug. And as I sat there or stood there listening to this person complaining about the condition of my rug, you all saw that a, few, a month or so ago, how bad it was? It was horrible. As that person was sitting, was standing there in my face complaining to me about the condition of the rug that's a member of this church, I knew in the back of my mind that over the last 12 months they had not given $200 to this church. Total. And I wanted to say to them, you know, if you would give a little bit more, I could have the rug cleaned every month. It's hard to pay the bills when you don't have the money. You all know that in your personal life. Why do you think the church is any different? And yet we think, I don't have to give because God will provide. And we don't understand that when we do that, God's got his tape measure out. And he's measuring us. You say, well, where do you get that from, Jim? Well, I get that from Malachi 3.6. And we're going to go to Malachi 3 real quick. I'm going to read 6 through 14. In Malachi 3.6, he says, the Lord... He says, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. God loves us even when we don't love him. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have, kept, have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. You ask, but how are we to return? So they're saying, well, wait a minute. Did we drift away? And, and if we did drift away, how do we return to you, God? You're in heaven. We're on earth. What, how do we do that? And and God nails it through the prophet Malachi. He says this. He says, Will you, a mere mortal, rob God, yet you rob me? This is how they had drifted away. They were robbing God. And they go, wait a minute. How are we robbing you? God answers in tithes and offerings. 
you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now get this, if you go to Deuteronomy, Leviticus, if you go out throughout the Bible, you'll hear, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus said this to Satan when he came out of the wilderness after 40 days of fasting and Satan tried to tempt him. Jesus said, don't put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. It's written in the Bible. Listen to this. We're not supposed to put God to the test, but when it comes to money, God gives us an exemption. When it comes to money, God says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, <coughs> and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now I want to bring that to modern day. I told you a few minutes ago that in 26, 27 years of financial counseling, I've never once counseled a family that was tithing about financial stress. It's true. That's a promise fulfilled by God. That's what he means right here in Malachi when he says, I'm going to take care of you. In Isaiah, he says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. What I want to say to you is that when you begin to invest in the eternal kingdom, God has your back. That doesn't mean you won't experience tough times. Believe me, we've experienced tough times. The Plater household has experienced tough financial times. So it doesn't mean that we get to avoid all the other pitfalls that everybody else gets. What it means is that through all that, God takes us through it in a peaceful, secure manner, and we don't worry about it. I don't worry about money. I have worried about money in decades because I have seen giving to God as an investment, not a tax. And when I look in my wallet, I don't look at the things I could buy versus the things I'll lose if I put it in the offering box. I look at the things that could be bought for the kingdom that will last forever versus the stuff I might buy that will rust and wear out and be stolen. Different perspective. So now let's go to the third point, authentic worship regarding money. What is authentic worship regarding money? Jesus gives this to us over in Luke, starting in, chap in chapter 11, starting in verse 37 and going through 42. When Jesus had finished speaking, he's just finished the... Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had just finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. And so he went and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not wash his hands before the meal. I've got this cute little video about where they punked people going into the, the bathroom. And they have a camera in the bathroom and people don't wash their hands. And when they come out, they shout, didn't wash his hands, didn't wash his hands. I can just see this Pharisee sitting here looking at Jesus. Didn't wash his hands. Didn't wash his hands. And Jesus ties it right back into the sin of money. Then the Lord said to him, Now then you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but, the inside, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Isn't it interesting how he ties the sin inside them compared to the false righteousness outside them, he compares it to greed and wickedness. We all know what greed is. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. And then he goes on to say, Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs. They were tithing. But you neglect justice and the love of God. Now this is where the American culture gets us screwed up. They stop right there and they say, Oh, God would rather we be involved in love and justice than giving a tenth, so we'll just go off and do love and justice and we can spend all our bucks on ourselves. 
But that's not where the verse stops. The verse says this, you should have practiced love and justice, in other words, the latter, without leaving the former undone. Jesus said, you should do all of it, not just a piece of it. People have come to me and they said, well, I don't want to give to the church money, so I'll give an hour of my time. I, I'm being honest with you. People have actually told me that right to my face. I don't want to give you guys 50 bucks, so I'll give you two hours of my time. My first thought was, I'm not sure you're worth $25 an hour. My second thought was, you're supposed to do both. You're supposed to do both. You're supposed to give your money and your time. It's not an either or. You don't barter with God. Here, God, take this, but I get to keep that. Authentic worship regarding money is when we give him all, not some. It's when we give him all. We don't keep a little bit here and give him that and feel like we've walked away justified. And so this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm closing the sermon off, so it's not going to be long at all. You get smiles on everybody's faces. Bang, bang. bang, bang. I just want to say this, until you have a change in perspective, until you start to see giving as an investment rather than a tax, you're never going to experience the joy that God promised when your treasure is close to God. You're never going to experience the joy of knowing that you measure up. You will always know that somewhere within your life, you are keeping a piece of your life from God. And because of that, you're under a curse. It's not a curse that you're going to hell. It's the curse that comes with any intentional sin. You'll struggle with money. You'll have worries about money. You'll be concerned about who's getting your bucks. You'll never have enough of it. The things you buy with that money won't bring you any satisfaction. You'll always want more. And someday when you stand before God, he'll look at that part of your life with tears in his eyes and he'll say, it could have been so much better. So as we worship God with our lives, giving our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto God, which is our reasonable act of worship, why do we exempt our money? God doesn't exempt our money. God understands that that may be the biggest idol in all of our lives. And he wants to help us throw that idol on the fire and worship God fully and wholly. And if we do that, maybe, just maybe, this church will accomplish those mission visions that God gave us so many years ago to do. Maybe we won't be like Jonah thwarting God's purpose for this church because we have 